Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and you have tuned into an episode that will be packed with valuable information about a newborn issue that comes up frequently and is not often detected or addressed as early as it could have or should have been. We're talking about tongue tie and lip tie. My guest today is a laser certified dentist and member of the International Affiliation of Tongue Tie Professionals. She offers in office laser phrenectomy treatment for assisting babies to latch onto the breast. In addition, she treats children and adults with functional frenuloplasty technique that integrates myofunctional therapy to best treat tongue restrictions at the Breathe Institute in Westwood, California. She is also a wonderful, kind, and big-hearted human being and recently became a mother herself. Dr. Chelsea Pinto, welcome to the podcast. Hi. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. So your training is in dentistry. How did you get into that? When did you know you wanted to be a dentist? I was that um, kid in third grade who filled out kind of, you know, a survey. What's your favorite color? What do you want to be when you grow up? And I wrote dentist on really? there. Yeah. So Are there dentists in your family? There aren't. Um, I always liked kind of my trips to the dentist and always remembered sort of that toy chest box that <laughs> that they would have. And you have your visit and you can go over to the toy chest and pick out your toy. And I always had a positive experience, um, not to say I didn't have any cavities. Uh, I did. So I experienced all of that. But um, Okay, but I have cavities. When I go to the dentist now, he has... Netflix. Oh, yeah. Over my <laughs> face with headphones on my ears. I had to do, because I did a horrible job taking care of my teeth, I had to do five fillings at once. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to be terrible. First of all, with all the techniques that you have, the gel and then the wiggling and then the shot, I didn't even feel the shot. <laughs> yeah. And I'm numb, but I'm watching Gotham on Netflix. And he did five cavities and he's like okay we're all done i was like really and like i just i forgot that they were even doing it kind like of. can i watch the next episode that's what or? i said to him i said i still have 12 minutes so he's like well we're done we need the chair it's like I maybe you can it. do one more cavity yeah <laughs> totally yeah it was a really how, nice experience how things have changed right seriously um, i did not have the dental experience you had they did have a treasure chest of toys <gasps> actually i just even like getting the toothbrush every time yeah right you always and, get a and goodie the little bag. pellets. Do you still use the pellets that make your teeth? Oh, yeah, the disclosing tablets. Yes. Um, I don't think they called it when I was They're used kid. time to time. Um, I liked them. They were just fun to play with. Yeah, I'm, I'm volunteering next week at the Police Association League. They're back to school night to do dental screenings. And I did it two years ago. Last year I couldn't because I had just had um, a child. my baby. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, the kids went crazy over those because they're just like, oh, my God, look at my pink teeth. Yeah, and and, yeah, I got pink, a brush here and here. And it tastes kind of interesting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So back to kind of how I got into dentistry, that was sort of the start um, of at least loving the experience. And then I went to high school and our high school had a vocational school attached to it in Indianapolis where I grew up. And I took the dental assisting class just to kind of get get some more exposure and see if it was something that I wanted to do for a living. And so I became a dental assistant first. In high school? Yeah, in high school. Wow. Um, so I assisted for a friend's father kind of the summer before uh, college, and I, I loved it. And I just – I went through, of course, all the prerequisites for um, pre-dental and – not Are to you say science. I, I mean, were those sciences? Did you like them? Some of them. Physics was not my jam. Um, yeah, they, it was. It was a hard well, they're road. They're so different. It's, I mean, biology and chemistry and physics are all yeah. and organic chemistry. Yeah, completely. they're just so different from each other. Someone who loves one probably wouldn't love right. all of them. Right. And I majored in um, anthropology and human biology, so I still kind of got. Um, just a different, I guess, take on the sciences, which was nice. It didn't have to be straight biology or chemistry. Anthropology is um, my wife's favorite store. Really? Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> if not. Store. Yeah, if I ever. It is a good store. Whenever the I candles up, are are mesmerizing. It almost doesn't matter what I get. If I mess up in our marriage, I just go to anthropology, and I come home, and I'm like, honey, I'm so sorry. And in fact, yeah. I think they should just call it an apology. Yeah. Here. I got you this box. I don't even know what's <laughs> in it. That's cute. You should tell them that. <laughs> a little Instagram. Oh, you're too witty. Yeah. Sorry. Back to you. So you were a dental um, assistant right out of high school. Yeah. Right out of high school. And then you took the sciences in Took college. the sciences, 
made through. Um, always kind of wanted to head to the West Coast. I met my now husband in college, and he was from Arizona. So we both wanted to head west, and thankfully USC takes – a fair number of out of state, <laughs> UCLA not so much. Um, but I was thrilled to be accepted at USC and had a fabulous experience there. Um, great faculty staff, and uh, I mean, as far as kind of what I'm doing now, was it what, was the dental training what what you want what you thought it would be? Was it exciting to you? It was. It was. Um, it was incredible. Yeah. And it wasn't until third year where you actually go in to see patients um, somewhat at the end of the second year. But that was obviously the most exciting, you know, to actually third year have out the of three drill. Or four? Third out of four. Okay. Yeah. So the so, second half is more hands-on and clinical. Correct. Oh, the drill. Right. You like the drill. Well, you see, the, the first half <laughs> you do have the clinic, but you're on – you're not on someone that salivates and – who are you on? Noise. You're on your little dummy. Oh, you're working on a dummy. Okay. <laughs> so then once you have a real person in front of you, it's a little different. I mean, what is that moment? Because I know what it was like as a chiropractor the first time you got to crack Yeah, somebody's. right. I'm um, sure that was. In fact, as we practice on each other. Yes. In student clinic. Mm-hmm. You also have a student dentist yes. clinic? Oh, boy. So I knew that the guy who was going to adjust me, like, really hasn't done it on people before. Right, right. And he also knew. He was so nervous. I could feel his hands trembling. Yeah. He was, like, dripping sweat. And so were you, right? <laughs> I was just like, get it over with. You know, whatever's yeah. going to happen is going to happen. And there's, a, you know, there's a, an attending doctor just watching the whole thing, right. making sure nothing horrible happens. But it, it was just – and then I remember doing it to somebody else. I'm like, okay, here it goes. And you don't give it enough and you got to go harder because you're, like, nervous to do it. Right, sure. How was a, that first drill? Well, thankfully, we didn't have to drill on one another, but we did have nitrous oxide day. Ooh, that sounds and fun. <laughs> anesthesia day, right. Yeah, the, the nitrous was – a little bit more entertaining than, um, you know, having an injection by your colleague where you you feel their hand trembling and mm-hmm. and all that. But um, I inject you. Yeah, yeah. D- to be honest, I don't remember the first time. I think it was. Uh, I don't remember the first time I I drilled on a human, which is kind of odd. It wasn't that long ago. Mm-hmm. Maybe it just blends together. But um, is it a, at a school clinic? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was exciting. I think it it kind of just sinks in and you get really used to it, like riding a bike and you can take time off and and feel like you still have it. So I think in the back of your head when you're sitting on the dentist chair, you're like, he's or she's done this so many times, they're not going to slip or screw up or move. And at least the people that are coming in for treatment at the dental school, they know that, hey, we're probably going to take a longer period of time than a general office that they're going to and and that kind of thing. Yeah. But um and then as far as my specialty now with um kind of assessing and diagnosing tongue ties mostly in infants, um that wasn't really taught in dental school. Or, oh, really? And, and not really taught in med school too much either. So I knew a little bit about tongue tie, but it wasn't until just a few years ago that I was kind of introduced to sort of this subfield uh, a friend of mine and colleague in Indiana told me that he was treating babies who had oral restrictions, and I thought it was really, really interesting and kind of came back um, to California from a trip home just thinking about it over and over, and and I always wanted to kind of have my own specialty, if you will, but nothing ever really um, just gelled with me. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. It was a way for me to to work with families, um, kind of reach out to my community. I've always liked working with kids. And so I started learning about um, what tongue ties were and their effects in infancy and adulthood as I was kind of traveling around the U.S. essentially going to tongue tie classes and learning from sort of the pioneers in the field. And But in your practice at this time, you're doing general dentistry. I'm not right now. Um, no, I'm saying during this time that you're going. Oh yes, yes. Uh huh. And learning about oral restrictions and, and getting more experience with yep. them. You're practicing general dentistry, right? From, and you don't have kids, right? Didn't have time. kids, right? So I had the freedom to travel around, and it wasn't until January that I kind of shifted gears and went solely into this specialty and spending um, kind of my days working 
with this. Just doing this. Okay, yeah. so let's talk about more about what it is. Sure. Um, and then after the break, we can maybe talk about how different ways to treat it. Yeah. Okay. So you, you mentioned oral restrictions. Is that more of an umbrella? And within it, there are different types of oral restrictions? Right. Um, so mainly we're talking about the frenulums in our mouth. And so lots of people are like, what is What's a frenulum? frenulum? <laughs> what did I just say? Is it English? Um, Does everybody have so, a frenulum? Right. Yes. Everyone is born with a frenulum. Okay. Uh, so it's essentially a cord of tissue. I, I, I will talk mostly about the frenulum underneath our tongue, okay. so our lingual frenulum. Um, and it connects the floor of our mouth to the underside of our tongue. Okay. Um, and about 5 to 10% of people are babies born. It's too tight, too thick, sh- too short. How many? Um, say again, what percent? 5 to 10%. Oh, five to 10. And okay. research is actually showing um, upwards to 12%. So it's definitely a real occurrence that needs more attention. And what's the function of the frenulum? Right. So it's just a stabilizing cord. Um, But in those people where it's, you know, an issue or too restrictive, then that's when we see kind of these issues with the tongue not being able to elevate up and over the lower jaw uh, to create kind of a suction with nursing. Um, We don't see the tongue being able to elevate to the palate. So then looking later in life, just that whole palatal development and influencing our airway, that's kind of where people are looking and and doing more research to kind of show the implications. So his normal function is to sort of deliberately restrict movement mm-hmm. to a degree. To it's a, a degree. stabilizer so yes, that the stable. tongue doesn't flop all over the place. Correct. Um, but if it's too tight, then mm-hmm. it, it's over-restrictive, and then the tongue can't do things that it functionally should be able to do. Right. So, for example, if the frenulum extends towards the tip of the tongue mm-hmm. instead of more kind of in that middle to back portion of the tongue, that's going to restrict the tongue from even, you know, helping to make uh, sounds la, to la, speak. La. Right. Um, and then, move it. And then the frenulum can attach tighter on kind of the floor area. So I have I see babies that come in that the frenulum is actually attaching to the lower jaw instead of um, the floor of the mouth. Oh, so wow. kind of almost instead has... Instead of, not in addition to. Well, sometimes in addition or to. Both. So sometimes it'll have almost two components, sort of label it as looking like an Eiffel Tower. Mm. might be helpful if we're looking at pictures, but... Yeah, um, we could post Yeah, some just kind there. of a, a multi linked frenulum. Actually, you have pictures you on your website. I do, yeah. So at the end, we'll talk about where we can find those pictures. Sure, so sure, you sure, can sure. see a visual with what we're talking about. Yeah, yep. So when the when the when when that frenulum is too tight, too restrictive, or just in the wrong place, yep. um, what kind of symptoms happen? Let's start with the newborn. Okay, so, so that shallow latch. Um, the baby's working overtime. They're trying to create kind of that vacuum suction with the lips instead of with the tongue. Mm. So we see kind of some lip blistering happening. Um, The baby's really tight in their lips, cheeks, even neck. So all of that is overcompensating. Every time they try to lift their tongue, their jaw is coming with the tongue. Mm. And so they're they're really sore and um, get tired out easily at the breast. Uh, So they don't nurse as long as they need to? Yes, that can happen. They just get kind of frustrated or they just fall asleep. Mm-hmm. Um, is multiple it times over and over again. With a bottle, does a bottle rectify that problem? Not always. No. So they can have the same problem. Same they can just have a hard bottle. time eating no matter what. Yeah. Um, if they can't create that seal with the tongue, um, we'll see kind of some milk spilling out of the corners of the mouth. So again, that can happen at the breast. With a bottle, too, uh, moms experience lots of pain typically because, again, the baby's sort of chomping down. Um, with the jaw? With Yeah, with the jaw. So the tongue's behind the lower jaw, and so they're just kind of gumming at the nipple, gumming, chewing. We'll see kind of a white, flattening sort of lipstick-shaped nipple when the baby's done with a session instead of kind of just that normal shape. Um so those are so some it's, big... it's uncomfortable for both, yeah, m- mother and baby. Right. Um, babies might have a lot of gas. So if they're swallowing more air than milk, that that air has to come out one way or the other. So whether it's gas or 
burping. These these moms are stopping multiple times a feed to burp their child because they just have all of this building up. Um, that tongue can't kind of create that that wave motion, right? That that peristaltic wave when we swallow. So they're just swallowing air and air and air. Well, they can't block the air from coming in. Right. Um, and are there babies that are more prone to have a tongue tie than other babies? Is it genetic? Is it um, the shape of the mouth? Yeah, there's um, research, again, that's been released, and and maybe at the end of the session together, I can give a really great book as a resource that some colleagues wrote, um, just kind of highlighting some of that research. But yes, it's it's inherited, um, it's X-linked, and typically oh, more really? common in males. Mm-hmm. Does it naturally soften up over time? Do they get mobility over time if you don't do anything? No. So the cord, the cord is anatomically fixed um, depending on the attachment point. So nothing will really stretch out. And, and you can have um, body work that, that can be obviously, you know, amazingly helpful, especially for these infants that are really tight. But it can only take us so far if the release isn't completed at an early age. Mm-hmm. And how does it, if it's not treated young, because you said you also treat adults. Right, right. So what, I mean, if they make it past that stage. Sure. What happens later in life with Yeah, that? so we, it's it's really cool to kind of be able to see the whole spectrum at our office uh, to help all ages. So my colleague there, Dr. Zaghi, he sees mainly the older children and adults. And, and I also see these age groups as well. But we see lots of um, patients that have sleeping issues. So sleep apnea, mouth breathing. Um, so again, going back to the tongue, the main idea is that in our resting posture, we should have our tongue to our palate lips closed and breathe through our nose. So if our tongue can't elevate to our palate, we don't get that natural kind of widening. Mm. Um, So instead we have a really high palate that's going into our our airway because the the palate is basically the the base of our nasal cavity. Okay. Um, So with a high palate, you're kind of decreasing the space that you have in your nose. And so we have to breathe somehow, so then we drop our mouth open. So the floor of the nasal cavity is pushed into the space where the yep. air would normally go. Exactly, through. So exactly. So decreased room for nasal breathing. Mm-hmm. And these kids will often have um, increased sinus infections, right, because they're they're more so breathing through their, their mouth and they have that decreased area too. Um, so that open mouth posture, kind of a forward head tilt because they're trying to create room to breathe. Mm-hmm. So if true. you lean your head forward, you'll you'll kind of create more of that passageway. Um, and then also teeth grinding relates also to these sleep apnea issues. And it's really kind of neat to think about, but sometimes this, this teeth grinding is because if, if you kind of do it right now you're kind of going forward and back with your teeth and again it's to create this room to try to breathe to try to get oxygen somehow yeah that's really interesting all from a tight piece of fiber underneath your tongue and that's not to say that right every every one of these symptoms links back to a tongue tie right there are other things that can cause this of course but it's it's hugely overlooked and and underdiagnosed, and that's again just because it's not really a focus in in dental school or medical school. So, right, so who would normally diagnose it in a newborn or in older kids or adults? Those that have gone through um, training on their own, and but that means that we're as parents we're kind of on our own a little bit. Yes. So, and, what are right. things that we can look for, or if we suspect this might be happening, who do we go to? Mm-hmm. My my biggest advice is to utilize a lactation consultant after birth. So, I mean, becoming a mom myself, I was definitely under the impression that breastfeeding is just straightforward. Oh, my gosh, we see in the movies it just looks like this beautiful, joyous moment, which many, many times it can be and you can get there. But in the beginning, I mean, it hurts and and there's lots flying around. There's lots of emotions and it's a little bit uncomfortable and you're you're kind of feeling alone. So to have a lactation consultant 
come over to your home. And I think that's really, really important because, of course, women see lactation consultants in the hospital, but it's just kind of a quick visit. You're not in your own environment. Things kind of shift once you get home. So seeing them in and your... And it's also usually just the first 24 hours when everything's still chaotic. Right. And, the, and oftentimes the milk is, is not, not even in. in. Yeah. So, I mean, it isn't in for at least Most. two, three days. Yeah. So having that lactation consultant come over as a guide, as someone that can offer support, suggestions, uh, that is key. And many of the lactation consultants that I work with, they they themselves are trained with how to kind of assess the tongue and they're, they're taking a look if they feel like they're seeing some of the symptoms and these things aren't improving over time. So uh, my diagnosis is based upon symptoms, function, and of course appearance, but you can't always see a tongue tie with the naked eye. So I'm really relying on lactation consultants and their reports of what they're seeing with these clients and babies. Symptomatically? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you say you can't see it with the naked eye, can you see it with instruments or sometimes you just really can't see that that's the issue? No, you can always see the tie, but um, those ties that extend more towards the tip of the tongue, mm -hmm. I'm saying, hey, most people could take a look regardless if, if you're in the medical field or not and just say that doesn't really look right. Um, but other times you really have to push back sort of the, the mucous membrane underneath the tongue and expose the cord. To really see it. To really see what's I going on. What and, and you can see other um, signs too, just sort of looking at the tongue shape and sort of the, the humping that, that will be created because of a restriction in the back portion of the tongue. I also imagine like anything else, when you see enough of them, you sort of get a, a sixth sense for mm -hmm. that's it and that's mm -hmm. not it. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously the more of them that you do, you yeah. really become invaluable in your expertise. Yeah. Um, when we come back, we'll talk about treatment options. But we also just before we get there, we mentioned briefly lip tie. Yes, lip tie. Um, now, the tongue is really the workhorse when it comes to breastfeeding. So that's going to be the main focus in um, – kind of what I'm I'm looking at regarding function. But there are many times where a baby with, because it is genetic, right, and so those frenulums might be linked up. And so there are many times where I see a child that has a, a tongue tie, and I always check the lip, even also the cheek areas too, sometimes have a really tight cord as well. A so cheek tie? A cheek tie, yeah, hmm. buckle ties. So the lip I treat... Um, you know, only if I see certain signs that it's influencing normal movement of the lip. So if there is kind of heavy blanching or whitening when I lift the lip up to the nose, I should be able to reach the nose with the lip. Okay. Um, also, if there's any notching in the jawbone. That so here, too, we all have a frenulum there. We all have a frenulum there. Under the lip. Correct. And in the cheeks. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's too restrictive. Right. And so these babies kind of can't relax their their upper lip to, again, sort of create that passive. The lip should be passive with breastfeeding, but still they should be able to kind of rest on the tissue and create closure. Mm -hmm. I can see how if it's pulled too high, yeah. you might not be able to do that. Yeah, and it's interesting with the lips, that bone notching, you can just see – um, how powerful our muscles are because, you know, as as they say, sort of in the battle between muscle and bone, muscle always wins. And it's because, hey, the, it's it's so, so tight that you really literally see a notch in, in, the, in the baby's bone. So, wow. you know, kind of right then and there that... Which has been happening, that means, since pre-birth. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know right then and there that there might be issues with tooth spacing down the road, um, early decay just because of kind of the pocketing that's created and the, and the milk can sort of pool in those areas. Um, but I don't necessarily treat the area just as a – just to kind of get ahead of maybe tooth spacing. I don't feel like that's adequate mm -hmm. enough. Sure. So I'm very careful with – Because you can do it later if you need exactly, to. Exactly. Exactly right. But, Is but it the only tongue, on the upper lip? The upper lip, you can also – you also have a frenulum on your lower lip. Typically, we so don't see that You to don't be, see that being too tight. I, I always check all of the areas, but I've never treated a, a lower lip tie, no. All right. Well, this is a wealth of information. Yeah, I know. It's it's kind of uh, – You present it in, <laughs> in very sort of easy to digest um, tidbits. So okay, I good. appreciate that. Well, I – 
it excites me to kind of educate others. And I think it's a great opportunity for women who are pregnant to at least know about this issue sure. and to have it on their radar. So and that at least they... here locally to have yes. you as a resource. I mean, it's just, you know, the babies, we want to do everything right for them. And this is right. a difficult decision. And you're, first of all, you're a new mother. But even before that, you're just so... Um, calming in your demeanor and obviously have a big heart. You're very caring. I said it in the opening and it's true. So Thanks. We're lucky to have you. Um, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back to explore treatment options and outcomes with Dr. Chelsea Pinto on the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. <laughs> Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and we're continuing our discussion about tongue and lip restrictions in newborns and older people with Dr. Chelsea Pinto. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, so does do these oral restrictions always have to be treated? That's a great question, and I'm probably asked that on a daily basis uh, from parents, and my best answer is just kind of giving a background on, again, how the tongue shapes our palate and shapes our development of our airway. And while I can't predict a child's future, I can just kind of go based off of the cases that we've seen at the office and kind of always saying, hey, if we did this earlier, if we got ahead of this, we wouldn't be dealing with kind of these issues that we see. The secondary symptoms? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Because you mentioned earlier, sometimes it's like with the tooth spacing. Well, it's a wait and see. Right. But but that is more with the upper lip kind of. There can be instances where I'm like, eh, yeah, this this isn't influencing here and now. Um, But with the tongue... It does have an influence on the here and now, and Always. it has the influence on development if if that's a very restrictive frenulum. I yes, see. and I can see that the tongue is not functioning to its full potential. Okay. So, and one other interesting thing that is really great to note that's just, it was something that was really eye-opening to me. Um, so when we breathe through our nose, our brain receives information and kind of brings us into this calm rest and digest state. So hence, you know. All, Parasympathetic. All of, right. So then once our mouth drops open and we are breathing through our mouth, instead of releasing kind of those feel-good hormones, the dopamine, serotonin, now we're releasing norepinephrine and cortisol. So funny, I just did it and I can feel like the anxiety the, build up. Yeah, it's, it's really... It's mind-boggling. And so does that so, make for a very fussy baby that won't sleep? Yep. Or? So kind of the, the colicky babies, there, there are more colicky babies or, you know, what the parents would say are just kind of hard to console, sort of diagnosed with reflux. And um, those, those issues can go through childhood and adulthood, too, because, yeah, we're in that fight-or-flight state when we're sleeping. So naturally the heart rate is increased. Um, you feel anxious. To be 40 years old and realize you have a tongue tie. Yes, that all of this could, could have, have gone prevented. back to maybe this tiny cord in underneath your tongue. Wow. Isn't it wild? That's really powerful. Yeah. So, I mean, at this conference that I was at in Toronto with um, a whole group of tongue tie professionals from around the world – they they would play videos of different patients that they would have every age. And there was an 83-year-old man with just, you know, totally imbalanced with his body. And, I mean, you could see even his posture completely changed after they just released his tongue. Wow. I mean, 83, like, and, it, and talking about his almost, sleeping it's changing. It's exciting, like, but it's sad. It's, it's yeah, like I talk about yeah. on our podcast all the time about how I'm face blind. And I didn't get diagnosed with face blindness till I was 39. Mm. And there's ironically a face blind bo- uh, group on Facebook, a prosopagnosia mm. group on Facebook. And the other day I just posted a question, how old were you? Because it's a very active group. Mm-hmm. It's like you don't meet people who are face blind. A lot of people who have it don't even know they have right. it. Right. So it's like if you want to find them, they're online is where you find them. And I just posted a question, how old were you when you realized what you have? is face blindness. Huh. 
And a handful found out by the time they were 5, 10, or even 15 years old. Most of them were between 20 and 40. Mm. And a bunch of them were in their 60s and 70s. And I, like even for me, when I found out, wow. it was, on the one hand, so relieving. And I'm like, what if I knew about this in high school? Right. What if I could have just told people, sorry, I'm never going to remember your face because that's right. the way my brain works. Wow, yeah. I, just would, have, I would have actually gone to parties. <laughs> right. And things like that. I wouldn't have been ashamed to go outside in public. So... For, and you would fe- and you would know that you had that support system out there, which yeah, would be from other a game changer. One hundred percent. Yeah, to know that there's other people out there going through the same exact thing as you, and and have a story to tell. So when I think about, and I know people the same way with ADD, they didn't yeah. realize for forty, fifty years that's what they have, and once they understand how their brain works, it's like a whole new world. Mm-hmm. Tongue ties is, I mean, I'm going to find out in a minute what the treatment is like, mm-hmm. but it's almost like if you know you have it. Yeah. Then it seems like because of all the symptoms that it can cause both as a newborn and later on, Mm -hmm. that it's worth treating it early on. Right. Right. How do you treat tongue tie? So I personally use a laser at the office. Um, It cauterizes as I work. It's a 20-second procedure. So The whole thing is 20 seconds? 20 seconds. Yeah, sometimes less. Cauterizing meaning it seals the... It stops Seals the bleeding? Blood, right. So we don't have to worry about any bleeding with, with the new babies. Okay, that very... sounds space age. But how did they do it before lasers came along? Yeah, and um, with scissors. And there are providers that still use scissors. And, and you just it's really it? said, it, yeah, it's really said it's kind of not about the tool that you use, but about the training with a provider. Um, I personally like to use a laser just because I feel like it's more of a, a, like a painting mechanism and I can just release exactly a, as much tissue as I need mm-hmm. and the body just kind of blossoms open. Um, I have a oh, video wow. video up online that kind of shows I the see procedure. That. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. So that's why I personally use a laser. Is that um, frenulum, does it have nerve endings? Is it? No, it's just the mucosal membrane that I'm going so through. So you don't even feel it when. Um, the baby might feel a little bit of discomfort, but I use a topical numbing agent and it lasts for about 30 minutes total. But the baby can still nurse or go to the bottle after the procedure. Topical. So it's not an injection. It's just a, no, like yeah, a cream? Just a gel. Exactly. Yep. So you put that on first. The baby's I conscious that, the whole time? Yep. Yep. I just swaddle the baby. Is somebody holding them? Uh-huh. Or? I, I swaddle the baby and then my assistant just, just kind of holds the head steady. Okay. Um, the, the baby wears cute little safety glasses. Looks uh-huh. like a little. <laughs> a little swimmer and um <laughs> yeah you know the it's harder on the parents waiting the few minutes that I take the baby right across oh, they don't the hall come in and, with and you? no I don't have them come in just they freak out yeah that most of them just would rather even take a walk to the restroom and come back and then we're finished sometimes I'm even like where are they yeah hey, <laughs> I'm we're <all> waiting and <laughs> bouncing the baby you know we're waiting for mom or dad that sounds um, so simple. So a little topical anesthetic, mm-hmm. then the laser. Then the laser. And I, again, it's just kind of a, a painting of the tissue. Um, I might be switching over to using a CO2 laser, which is a slightly different mechanism, sort of more of a, I guess you can say, a kind of evaporating the tissue. Um, okay. Again, seals off the blood vessels too. So there's so, very little bleeding or no bleeding? Exactly. Yep. So same thing there. And um, baby's back, they can nurse. And then as far as the healing, baby might be a little bit fussy for the first 24, 48 hours afterwards. But I always encourage lots of skin to skin. Um, I give the parents some kind of pain management options that they can use, some natural routes. Um, And oftentimes I have parents who say, you know what? I finally had my baby sleep a four-hour stretch, or they had the best sleep ever last night. And again, going back to it's like this full body release. And in adults, we can vocally hear what it feels like when we when we treat their frenulum. They're like, oh, my God. Like, in I, the voice I, when they start Oh, yeah. Speak? We've had people cry in the office. It's like this catharsis. It's it's just years of tension that's just been built up. And okay. So, how do you do it on an adult? Because you're not swaddling them. Yeah. So um, we use scissors and sutures and we suture the area just because it's more surface area and that way the wound can heal with uh, primary Oh, So intention. adults, you don't use the laser? Um, sometimes I do on children, but on adults, on we do 
we do incorporate uh, myofunctional therapy at the office, so kind of that body work in in office, and so adults kind of have a different or protocol. Body work out around the mouth. Both. Oh wow! Both. Um, you do that before the clipping. Yes. So for adults, since there's years of built up tension, um, we're kind of training the tongue, if you will. Um, so they'll usually have about four to five sessions of myofunctional therapy with a therapist at our office before we can go ahead and move forward with treatment. And that just ensures that we can get the best result Afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. And then on the day of treatment, what happens? For adults? Yeah. Are they um, so awake they come in. They... Yep, they're awake. And we just use, again, a topical. We do do inject a, a little bit of lidocaine. You don't need very much. Mm-hmm. So really only a few drops. And they're, they're... – Are they strapped down? No, no. They'll be numb. So they don't feel anything. They don't feel it. Oh, no. so it's just like going to a dentist for yes, something exactly. else. Yes, exactly. Right. Yes. It's, okay. it's Watching not, Netflix. not scary. Yeah, the worst part is the injection. And right. I was, really I like the topical gel that we have. You oh, barely feel it was the injection, so good. The so. gel and that little wiggle. Now maneuver. we just need the now we just need the Netflix. <laughs> the Netflix. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's a missing do. link. Um, and then for babies, since we don't, you won't put, be able to get them off your chair. Yeah, <laughs> the procedure is too quick. How long does it take in adults? Twenty minutes to just depending on the severity. Slightly Twenty longer. minutes because there minutes. you don't have a laser, so you do have some bleeding. Yes, but the big the the reason why it takes a little bit longer is because we take some breaks in between to kind of let the body adjust. So we're we're sort of more of a whole body approach instead of just, hey, get in there and, and, and get, get it out. And get it, uh, yeah, because we're taking into account that this is something that the person has lived with for so many years. And we have the myofunctional therapist step in for the treatment too, to just kind of feel different areas of tension and, and kind of guide the patient to going through the process. And then how long is their recovery in adults or older kids? Adults typically have um, some discomfort. I'd say for a good five to seven days, um, sometimes their discomfort they'll feel throughout their neck too, just because things all loosen up. Um, it's a shift. But they're a bit, they're, yeah, huge shift. And, and they're a bit more sore because sometimes we do go through a little bit of muscle under the tongue if that's restrictive too. I see. And there's just more surface area under there. It kind of sounds like it's much better to take care of it as right. an infant. And I don't, I don't put stitches in the babies. Um, and I do have the parents lift up the tongue. So there's kind of a lifting exercise that they do. About three times to four times a day, and I go over that with them in the office too. What's so, the, what's the purpose of that exercise? So, the purpose of the lifting is just to make sure that um, those raw surfaces under the tongue don't kind of stick together oh, because I see. that's what inside adhesions. the mouth they'll just kind of want to stick. So, I see them five days to seven days after the treatment. If there's any areas kind of sticking, I, I can do a nice deeper stretch and mm-hmm. and get those unstuck. I see. Yeah. Are th- so right after you do it on infants or newborns, um, do they go right on to a latch mm-hmm. immediately afterwards? Yeah, and it's really exciting because many times there's an instant change. In, For both, the baby yeah, and the mother. Yeah, which is like goosebumps and tears, and it's amazing. And and then there's times when, hey, a few days pass, and, oh, my God, the baby finally latched without the nipple shield, and oh, my God, my child just ate solids for the first time without gagging and choking because they can move their tongue effectively. So, again, it is a team approach. I do the release in the office, and then I always refer babies to see a body worker, craniosacral therapist um, close to their area, or a speech therapist if they're an older child will refer them to continue working. Ideally, they should be seeing someone beforehand, too, if that's kind of the age range that they're at. For for babies, is there are there pros and cons to laser versus scissor? No, just a different way to do it. Different way to do it, and my biggest piece of advice is to go to someone with adequate training and someone who is up to date with the techniques and methods behind infant tongue tie. The technique is called phrenectomy. Correct. Is that right? So what what is how do you know if you're wherever you're sitting across the country? How do you find somebody? Are there special credentials that you look for? Well, um, going back to kind of your Facebook support group, I know that there are Facebook groups in every state and there's a database online 
as well with uh, tongue tie professionals listed on there. So there's thousands and thousands of moms that have kind of told their stories and shared their stories and go on there for support. And so they have people that they recommend in the area. And I think, I mean, as a mom myself, I think going to someone that you can hear about and... But this is um, pretty much all you do now. Yes, this is all I do now. So I went back to work part-time after having my son. And I think it took having my son to really go through breastfeeding myself and just... I came back to work and and I was just seeing babies on Fridays at my office that I was at in Santa Monica. And every Friday it was like that was my favorite day because I was connecting with people that had been going through what I just went through. And and not my my son didn't have a tongue tie. Um, My family joked, "Okay, so you look to see (laughs) he's a boy or girl. And then (laughs) does he have a tongue tie? Um, But, yeah, it's just I. There's something to be said once once you become a parent and you just kind of get it. And before that, I didn't get it. And so that's kind of what it took for me to I say. I keep coming back to this passionate piece of you, but you are a big heart. And you, I mean, you clearly love what you do because of the profound effect that it has on helping mothers and babies. Yes. Um, are there people who are resistant to doing it? Not, Not so much, although I have parents that are maybe a little bit nervous, which is so normal, um, a little bit apprehensive. um, But I always want parents to feel like this is the next step for them. So if I if I have parents where I feel, hey, I mean, to be honest, it's a lot of information. And if they're kind of getting it for the first time from me, and I can tell that they're not really sure what to do, then hey, go home and, and here are some exercises that you can do with a baby and and why don't we connect next week and kind of see how things are going. So if they want a lot of information, they can listen to the Informed Pregnancy podcast. Yeah, a, right. A yeah. wealth of information <laughs> there's a, there. It's a lot. Are there any potential side effects, long lasting side effects? Of having the treatment or not uh, having yeah, the treatment? Yeah. Well no of having it. We talked about not having it, but if you do it, right. are there things that like, uh oh, this could go wrong or yeah, I mean, it is an oral procedure, so there are risks involved. So, again, going to someone who who knows what they're doing <laughs> would be primary. Um, but, I mean, the procedure, it's to be honest, it's not rocket science. It's, it's the same procedure every time, and I'm just going through a mucous membrane. And, again, maybe sort of watching it in action can kind of show that you're sort of just releasing tension and the body just opens up naturally. Um, so, no, there aren't there aren't any... Does it ever grow back? ...negative side effects. You do see a new frenulum that grows. Mm-hmm. Can it so, be a tied frenulum again? If the stretches aren't done, yes. So if the Well, the you give them the sticks, stretches to yes, do... Yes, and, and I have all my families come back early on check. so I can check. But there have been a few times where I see some reattachment and say symptoms got better and then they reappeared. Um, Some kids maybe heal a little bit faster than others. So there's been probably three to four patients I've had in a number of years, but I decided to go ahead and redo the treatment and have them come in more regularly for follow-up just to make sure that we can keep that area open. And is the procedure the same for the lip ties and the cheek ties? Yes. Mm -hmm. Same exact thing. Same exact thing. Well, you shared a lot of information. Yeah. I mean, it. you hear about tongue tie and lip tie, but I think most people really don't know anything about it until it's they're in it. Yes, exactly. And so exactly. it would be great, you know, uh, jokes aside, it would be great to share this podcast with other expecting parents so that, you know, should it happen, this is something that they can at least have in the back of their head to check out and maybe check off the list right. and move on or realize that it's this and just treat it as soon as possible. Exactly. You mentioned a book early on. Yes, the book is called Tongue Tied. It was written by um, some colleagues and um, Dr. Richard Baxter. He put together this really, really informative book that I feel like highlights all of this information and puts it in one place. So even for professionals like myself, just kind of having this to share with others. Um, there's there's a chapter on just developments later in life. There's a chapter on kind of the most current research on this because I think that's something that that some of the professionals want to see too. And it's it's all there. All of the like information the is there. Tongue tied Bible. So, 
Yeah, so tongue tied. I ordered mine on Amazon. So I've heard of that little boutique. Yeah, and all the proceeds go to um, charity. Which oh, is that's cool. really so, nice. Yeah, cheers to educating. Right? Um, Dr. Pinto, where can we find you online? You can find me at um, the Breathe Institute, or you can find me at drchelseapinto.com. That's pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks a million for being here and for sharing your expertise and your passion for what you do. Yes, thank you for having me. Pleasure. And at home, thanks for listening. If you have any topics that you'd like to hear a discussion about, send your suggestion to info at informedpregnancy.com. Thank you.